Book 3, Chapter 6 The Messiah Exalted Matthew 28 One thing ought to make us marvel as we come to this final consideration about Matthew's Messiah. It is this, the reserve of Matthew as he records the exaltation of the king. Carefully and reverently he recorded his entombment. There is something to marvel at here. Two men of whom we know little took it upon themselves to retrieve his body and to bury him. Two secret disciples, at the end, found their courage and boldly went to Pilate and asked for the Lord's body. The apostles who had accompanied with him in the good days and in the bad, through the zenith and through the decline, who wanted to sit on his throne and had been promised twelve places of supreme authority, they were not at the burial. Not many attended the funeral, just these two secret disciples and two Marys, Mary of Magdala and Mary the mother of James and Joseph. They stayed and they watched to the end. Four people at the funeral of the Messiah. The Lord's Burial It is not uncommon to attend the burial of someone you have reason to love and through whom your life has been changed. There were many who had good reason for being there, measured by our Western ways. Where were Lazarus and Martha and Mary? What about the widow of Nain? Jairus and his girl? The bridegroom of Cana? Unfair to ask? Yes, no doubt. It is Passover time. But what a strange thing it is. A man who had helped so many, who had brought joy and solace to so many hearts, upon whose words the weary had rested. At his end, just two men and two women. But notice this. They were the gentlest and most attentive people of all. They wrapped the body of the king in clean linen and laid it in the tomb. As you read between the lines, do you not gather a sense of the gentle reverence with which they executed this last solemn duty? He had been bruised and broken by wicked hands. Sin became exceedingly sinful, and in the conflict he was mauled by the brutality of the infamous. With obscene lips they blasphemed and spat upon his face. But once the victory was won, once the Armageddon of the Ages had been fought and the triumph assured, then God allowed no hand of infamy to touch him. The psalmist had said, Thou wilt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And no corrupting power was allowed to interfere with his burial. With gentle hands moved by love, they wrapped him and laid him. Every defiling power was excluded. Every polluted association was outlawed. God allowed no longer the forces of sin to defile the temple of his body. Nor did any eye set on him but the eyes of those who were destined to share his glory. Such was the concern of the Father for the Son. On a point of accuracy, and for the sake of any to whom it may not be clear, notice that Joseph rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. Matthew 27, verse 60. Every word is important and the word rolled is accurate. The stone was round and large, like a millstone, and, as the sepulchre was properly prepared, the stone moved in a groove which sloped towards the tomb entrance. Joseph rolled the stone towards the other end of the groove, and consequently across the hole of the entrance. Once it was in position, it could be blocked, and in any case, it was much harder to move the stone away than to move it into position because to move it away was to have to move it uphill along the groove. Hence, when the women came the day after the Sabbath to continue the embalming, they said, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? Mark 16, verse 3. They could not do it. They did not have the strength. So when Matthew says that Joseph departed, this is how the sepulchre was left. The next day, at the instigation of the Pharisees, Pilate agreed to the sepulchre being made sure setting a watch and sealing the stone. This is likely to mean that clay was plastered over the stone's edge and the border of the cave, and into the clay the pressing of a seal to ensure that it could not be interfered with in secret and without authorization, and the guarding by the soldiers. Pause for a moment to ponder this. Was there ever such an exhibition of impotence? Seals and soldiers to watch the body of a dead man? If you are willing to concede that there is laughter in heaven, there must have been laughter in heaven. They thought they were being shrewd. Gabriel must have smiled. In spite of all their precautions to stop the body being stolen, 
he left the tomb of his own volition. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Matthew records something which, as it appears to me, is wonderfully inspiring. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Matthew 28, verse 2. Here is the part that is so splendid. The angel rolled back the stone and sat upon it. Angels do not sit. They have no need to sit. Have you ever read in the Bible of angels sitting? Remember, to Zacharias there appeared an angel standing on the right side of the altar of incense. The angel said, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. Luke 1, verses 11 and 19. Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee. Acts 1, verse 10 and 11. John said, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Revelation 7, verse 1. Cornelius said, A man, an angel, stood before me in bright clothing. Acts 10, verse 30. But this time the angel sat. He rolled away the stone and then sat upon it. It seems to me there is a significance in this. The stone was man's invention to keep the body of Jesus in the tomb, sealed and guarded. Now to sit upon something is to demote it, to devalue it, to diminish it. By sitting, the angel from heaven was saying that Roman power is rejected, that Jewish priesthood is rejected, that human culture is rejected. The forces which were intent upon the destruction of the Messiah are spoiled and finished. It was a splendid gesture from heaven of the fact that is described by Peter, This Jesus hath God raised up, being by the right hand of God exalted. Acts 2, verses 32 and 33. This resurrection was a raising to exaltation. Others had been raised from death, but this was different. This Jesus hath God raised up. This man who is rejected by men is accepted by God. The Creator is saying in the sight of all humanity that this man alone is acceptable to him and that no others can be acceptable unless they join themselves with the exalted one. This one man alone receives the approbation of the Father in heaven. His life as the Messiah is at last sealed by the empty tomb, the sitting angel and the earthquake. This man's victory was won on the cross that the Greeks said was foolishness, the Hebrews said was anathema, and the world said was empty and useless. The resurrection of the Messiah is saying to them, You are the foolishness. You are under the curse. You are empty and without power. The true attestation of the fact that what men in their folly thought was useless is the one thing through which their ultimate redemption is to be accomplished. No human eyes ever witnessed the resurrection, but no human being can ever escape its effect. Early on that morning, after the Sabbath, something remarkable happened in the garden. The clothes were undisturbed, but he was gone. The prince of life among the dead. Out of the tomb and past the guards, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the man who is visible and invisible, he is gone. Old death riding on his pale horse is vanquished, left breathless. This is what the angel said. Jesus, which was crucified, he is not here. They wanted to keep him there at all costs, lock him in the grave, forget him. But the angel said, he is not here. Matthew said the keepers became as dead men. There is a nice irony here. The one who they certified as dead is alive and is gone. And those who were sure that they were alive became as dead men. No wonder the angel asked, why seek ye the living among the dead? Marvel then at the reserve of Matthew. Let us retrace our steps and look again at some of the things recorded by Matthew. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Chapter 28, verse 2. Because this reference to the earthquake occurs in verse 2, we should not suppose that it actually occurred after the events recorded in verse 1. That is, we should not think that the earthquake happened after the women had arrived at the sepulchre. Verse 2 is in parenthesis, an interpolation to explain the presence of the angel when the women reached the garden. Sometime during the night, towards dawn perhaps, the angel came. Matthew says, His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. Human minds are compelled to use human syllables to describe the indescribable. 
strong men, men of iron, Roman soldiers. They were part of the garrison seconded to the Jewish authorities during the feast to keep order, so not the temple guard, but part of the centurion's company on special duty for the Passover. Men of steel nerves and hard resolution. These men were terrified. They were filled with fear. As Matthew tells it, they fainted with fear. Like dead men they were. Later on, when they come to tell what happened, not one of the authorities who heard them sought to cast any doubt upon their story. No one said they must have been dreaming, or they had been deceived. It must have been evident that something terrible had happened to these steel-nerved soldiers. So they gave large money to them to invent a story. It must have been large indeed, because it is not easy to persuade a Roman soldier to admit that he was asleep on duty. Indeed, in normal circumstances, such an admission would result in court-martial and death. They did not think out the invented story very well. Have you noticed how foolish it was? His disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Verse 13. If they were asleep, how would they know what had happened? And if they awoke just as the disciples were leaving, they, the soldiers, could easily have caught them, struggling with a corpse. When people are desperate, it often happens that the pressure of the anxiety leads them into childish folly which under calmer circumstances they would never dream of following. Notice Matthew was careful to say that the fainting of the soldiers was through fear of him, the angel, not through fear of the earthquake. They were paralyzed through fear by the sight of the angel. Perhaps when he went into the tomb, they gathered such strength as they could muster and crept away in terror to report their experience. So the blinding glory of the man from heaven was to some a cause of fear, and to others a cause of comfort and assurance. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. I submit we are all entitled to seek illumination of this poignant incident from the Acts of the Apostles. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Acts 1, verse 9. The Ascension. Although Matthew does not record it, I think we are entitled to feel that after the last word of his gospel, we may think next of his ascension. Perhaps it was no ordinary cloud which received him out of their sight. It has been suggested it was the cloud of the Shekinah glory of God, which was seen by Abraham and Moses and David and Hezekiah and Elijah and Elisha and Peter, James and John on Horeb's height, and which John saw again on Patmos. It would be appropriate. It seems right. Not an ordinary cloud, but one rich with the glory of the Father. When Jesus comes again, it will be with the clouds and with the Father's glory. Notice the first thing the Messiah did when he came to heaven. He sent two angels to earth. He said to them, Go and comfort those men of mine at Bethany. Say to them, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Acts 1 verse 11 Did he not know that the first moments of separation are the most intense and the most severe? Matthew records that Jesus said to them, And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world, or age. We do not often speak of the ascension, but it is coupled inseparably with the resurrection. It is the highest manifestation of the exaltation of the Messiah. That this is so is shown from the words of Paul to the Ephesians. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Ephesians 4 verses 9 and 10. What is meant by Paul when he says, he also descended first into the lowest parts of the earth? I would think that the words which best define it are in Philippians chapter 2. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, 
even the death of the cross. Verse 8. That is the dissension because it is rock bottom. You cannot get lower than that. Think of the shame of it. When we read Matthew chapter 26, we knew it was not refined, it was vulgar, the death of the pure and spotless by the hands of lawless men. Alone he trod the winepress. Being in the form of God, nevertheless he descended and came to rest in the lower parts of the earth. He was numbered among the transgressors. We must interpret the ascension by measuring the dissension. By this, the disorder was ended, the pollution was halted, the sin is cancelled. Here is the wonder. As the light of the glorious resurrection of the Messiah is flashed upon it, the brutal cross is revealed as the trysting place, where broken men can be remade, and where there is pardon, peace, and purity for the undone. Here the polluted are blood-sprinkled and purified. As Paul tells it in Philippians 2, remember the next word after the death of the cross? Wherefore. This is the word which joins the dissension to the ascension. It is the bridge between the past and the present, and all that by the grace of God is now to be accomplished in the future. Highly exalted. Matthew records that Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. What a splendid affirmation of intent. So Paul says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Wherefore, because the disorder is ended, and the pollution is halted, and the sin is cancelled, and the curse of death is vanquished. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 9-11 to So the name that was bestowed upon him through the angel, the hero named Joshua, the name of the boy next door, is bestowed upon him again in heaven. God the Father is saying, My Son alone, the Beloved, He has fulfilled the name. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul wrote that God set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The right hand of God is the most exalted place in the whole of the universe. It is the place of infinite and unfading glory, the place where weariness is unknown, where weakness never comes, where darkness is banished. He was subjected to weakness here. He has all the power there. He was weary here. He is beyond weariness there. He was assaulted by the powers of darkness here. He is in unapproachable light there. At the center of God's glory, he is exalted and empowered. At the center of the universe is the man of the seamless robe, the carpenter of Nazareth, Mary's child, waiting for the day when, in flaming advent glory, he will burst forth upon the world as King of kings and Lord of lords, the exalted Messiah. Not yet do we see the glory of the victory. Not yet do we see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, the man of our humanity, the man touched with the feeling of our infirmity, exalted to the right hand of God. Let us not mistake it in any sense. This one, the child of the eternal spirit, the exegesis of God, the firstborn from the dead, is exalted as a prince and a savior and is now at the center of the universe. Now the thing to remember is that in the mind and the purpose of God, he ever was at the center. Think of Psalm 24. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in the holy place? Verse 3. That question is soon answered in the psalm. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Verse 4. Although the answer came swiftly in the psalm, earth waited, spent and restless, for the day when the one lonely, concentric man would come to an eccentric world and match the perfection which God had revealed in the psalmist's soul. No man could ascend the hill of the Lord and stand in the holy place in the right of his purity and cleanness and utter integrity, save this one man of Nazareth. He alone was exalted because of his clean hands and pure heart, and because he never once lifted up his soul unto vanity. He is the man in whom there is no cunning, no double dealing, no guile, a man who dwelt in the realities and became obedient unto death, yea, the death of the cross. 
So the exaltation is of the perfect pattern of human life, wounded, bruised, afflicted, descending, and then ascending and standing in the holy place. This is the vision of the Holy Spirit in the word of Psalm 24. Thus, in the mind of God was the exaltation of the Son before he was born. It can be seen again in Isaiah. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, and the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Chapter 45, verses 22 and 23. Let us understand that in these words, God is speaking geocentrically, as though the earth were a circle and God is at the center. The expression, the ends of the earth, means the circumference of the earth. God at the center is speaking to the circumference and to those who move upon it. The idea is confirmed by the meaning of the word look. Look unto me, all the ends of the earth. Verse 22. Literally, the Hebrew is, turn and face unto me, as though from whatever position upon the circumference men may be, if they are to be saved, they must turn and face towards the center, because at the center is the Savior. What constitutes the center? The answer is in verse 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. You do not have to be a genius to see that Paul has taken these words of Isaiah 45, words which describe the center of the universe, and has used them to describe the exaltation of the Messiah, the only begotten, in Philippians chapter 2. Turn and face unto me all the ends of the earth. God is saying emphatically that it is only as men do this and associate themselves with the one who is exalted and central that they have any hope of being saved. He is saying this man alone is acceptable and only those who are his. The prince of this world is judged. There is an interesting allusion to this in the Gospel of John. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. John 16, verses 7 to 11. Notice what Jesus is doing here. He is speaking of the testimony of the Holy Spirit to the world. The Holy Spirit was to come, that it is to come upon the apostles, and by that they would with spirit inspiration testify to all men the truth about salvation. They would testify of sin, that is, they would reveal a new measurement through which the sin of human hearts would be identified because of their unbelief. Than this, of righteousness, because I go to my Father. Notice the words, because I go to my Father. That is a reference to the ascension and exaltation of the Son. A new pattern of righteousness has been revealed by the life and death of the Son, and because he is able to pass from earth to the very presence of God, because I go to my Father. It is a signal to all men that this man's righteousness alone is approved. There was nothing to keep him out of heaven. There was no barrier, shutting him out from the abode of the invisible God. This is the new ideal of life, a new pattern of living, not written upon stone, but upon the heart, able to ennoble the relationship of man with man, and make all things new. Thus, because I go to the Father, is the proof that his exaltation is based upon his purity and perfection. So to finish the quotation from John, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Because of his triumph over sin, and because of his consequent exaltation and ascension into heaven, the final judgment of God is pronounced against sin. When God raised him and exalted him, he was saying in the sight of all flesh, all men, unlike him, I reject. If you say it is severe, you are right, it is severe. God does not parlay about gradations of sin. The prince of this world has been judged. When the Messiah rose from death and ascended to heaven, the final verdict on sin was formulated and passed and executed. Christ judges the world, proclaims its failure, and says that left to itself it is doomed. This is the very essence of the truth which we all believe, that human life, good or bad, is alike not sufficient to save the race. 
When God said his beloved is the anointed one, he is at the same time saying that the victory over sin which he accomplished is the only source of redemption for sinning men. Those who serve the prince of this world and will not change are doomed and sentenced. The prince of this world is the mastership of this world. Worldliness is revealed in that life which lives as though this were the only world. The life that willfully is full of everything apart from God is judged and condemned. Observe then how far-reaching the exaltation of the Messiah really is, in its severity for those who willfully oppose the purpose of God, in its love and redeeming power for those who are glad to receive him, and in its complete fulfillment of all that God intended when he said, Let us make man. Messiah at the center. This, it seems to me, is in the mind of the Hebrew writer when he wrote the great Hebrew letter, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3. It means, as it appears to me, that everything in the universe is set in relation to the Messiah at the center. When God said, let us make man, centrally it was the Messiah he meant. When the Hebrew was pardoned for his sins by the blood of the Lamb, offered on the altars of Israel, centrally it is the blood of Christ which did it. When God said, let there be light, it was Christ which flashed the true light into the universe of God. When God said, I am, centrally it was the Messiah who was to be the perfect and the unique manifestation of the Godhead in the realm of humanity. Abraham saw his day. Moses bore his reproach. Israel drank of his living water in the wilderness. He is at the center of all history. All that went before him in time was a preparation for his manifestation. Remember, earth was waiting, spent, and restless. The development of empires, the spread of language, the condition of knowledge, all prepared the world for his coming. All the lines of Hebrew history converge upon him. All the prophecies of Hebrew destiny depend upon him. All the hopes and all the aspirations, all the songs and all the poetry which sighed for salvation have been made incarnate in him. The age abiding center of all creation, old and new, the exalted Messiah. What Pilate said skeptically is true essentially. Behold your king. And let us not miss this point. His exaltation does more than argue his perfection though it does that wonderfully. More than that, it is the assurance to all of everything that is promised for the future. It is the guarantee of security against all the forces of evil. Because God exalted him, we know that none can ever dethrone him. And let us face it, they will try, as they always have, and as they do now. Say, he is not there. Say, he is dead. Say, he never existed. Say, he is not coming patronize him, dethrone him at all costs. That is what they say. Listen to Matthew telling us the word of the Anointed One. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Listen to the promise of the proof. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Psalm 2, verses 1 to 3. And the answer is your hope. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Thou art my son. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen, nations in the RV, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Verses 6 to 8. Again, his enemies shall lick the dust. Psalm 72, verse 9. The greatest enemy of all he met face to face and front to front, met it, defied it, and defeated it. The prince of this world was beaten in a fair fight, so the victor broke the bars of death asunder and went his shining way into the presence of the eternal spirit, the Father. He is exalted, heaven recognizes it, the earth knows it, and because of it every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank God that he raised up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. 
We thank God that he is coming soon, Matthew's Messiah. From him all light is streaming, and all songs are coming, and all hope is flaming. Across the fret and fever of the world, he will cast the infinite peace of God. There is cause for joy. As you come to the close of our brief consideration of Matthew's Messiah, you have reason to go in peace, with a lilt in your step, and with a song in your heart. God grant you may feel it to be true. Book 2, Chapter 3, The Pattern Prayer, Peace, Purity, and Power There will be no dispute that the prayer which begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, is the pattern prayer. It was uttered by the king in response to the question from his next of kin, his apostles. Lord, teach us to pray. 